Gary Law is here. I'm unmuted and I'm here. <laughs> I'm at the North Pole though, so. It looks like it. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 19th annual Poets Speak event here at Bangor Public Library. I'm very pleased to be working with Kathleen Ellis again this year. This will be the third, third year Kathleen and I've worked on this together. And this is in celebration of National Poetry Month. There will be some different social media posts coming out of the Bangor Public Library. And if you look around the state, you'll see that there are many um, uh, celebrations of this um, monthly event going on. <clears throat> This year's Mini Poets Speak um, is co-sponsored by the University of Maine Honors College. Kathleen uh, Ellis's latest collection is Outer Body Travel and her poems have recently appeared in the Cafe Review Enough Poems of Resistance and Protest and in A Dangerous New World, Maine Voices on Climate Crisis. Poems from her manuscript, Dear Darwin, were set to music and released as a Parma recording CD which was nominated for a 2015 Grammy Award. And with that, I will turn this over to Kathleen. Okay. Welcome everybody. And thank you so much uh, to the library and of course to the Honors College as well. Um, we often have been co-sponsored with the English department, but this year, uh, since we have a special presentation by Honors College students, um, it seemed fitting to have the co-host be the Honors College. So Candy, thank you so much for everything you've done. Uh, we're gonna start, Gary and I, Gary Lawless and I are gonna start by doing a tearful, a tearful little duet um, for the late, great Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Uh, almost everybody here knows, everyone I can see knows that I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. And when I was in high school, <laughs> I learned how to drive sort of and uh, so I took my parents' car and, and a, a few friends and drove from uh, where I lived then, about, I don't know, 30 miles away from San Francisco and crossed the bridge and, and ended up on top of, of one of those uh, embankments on the freeway <laughs> and then managed to get off the freeway and headed for North Beach. And that was my first time that I'd ever been to City Lights Bookstore. And there he was, there he was. Um, and he said, what do you want, poetry? And I said, absolutely. And he said, you have to go to the basement for that. Um, and it was my go-to bookstore ever since. Every time I go back to the Bay Area, I go to the bookstore, but now he won't be there. Um, Ferlinghetti was a poet, publisher of City Lights Books, a painter, especially in his later years, and a pivotal figure to the beats and about every other counterculture literary movement in San Francisco and everywhere else. And he died at 101 and um, I think sort of sentimentally um, wonderful to people in Maine is that he died on Emily Dickinson's birthday on February 22nd. And I'm just gonna read a short little poem by him. And it's from um, a longer piece called Poetry as Insurgent Art. And this is called, I am signaling you through the flames. I am signaling you through the flames. The North Pole, oh, where are you, Gary? The North Pole is not where it used to be. Manifest destiny is no longer manifest. Civilization self-destructs. 
Nemesis is knocking at the door. What are poets for in such an age? What is the use of poetry? The state of the world calls out for poetry to save it. If you would be a poet, create works capable of answering the challenge of apocalyptic times, even if this, if, even, if, even if this meaning sounds apocalyptic. You are Whitman, you are Poe, you are Mark Twain, you are Emily Dickinson and Edna St. Vincent Millay, you are Neruda and Mayakovsky and Pasolini, you are an American or a non-American, you can conquer the conquerors with words. Thank you. And Gary's gonna say a couple words too. Or more than a couple. Well, <laughs> In, in 1973, I, I had lived in Maine my whole life. Up until then, I was 21 years old, and I hitchhiked to California to live at the house of the poet Gary Snyder. And while I was living up there, every Sunday was sauna day, and we would keep the sauna going all day, and there was a batch of homebrew every weekend, and people from the Bay Area would come up and get naked and drink beer. And I got to meet all sorts of people. I met the Gover Governor Jerry Brown, I met Daniel Ellsberg, and I met Lawrence Ferlinghetti. And it's really weird to meet people in the sauna because when you first meet them, they're naked, you know? So <laughs> it was a nice way. But I had been a fan of, of City Lights. I'd never been to the bookstore, but I'd been a, here in Maine, I'd been buying books in the Pocket Poets series and it turned me on to all sorts of people I'd never known about, because Lawrence was not just interested in American poets. He was really interested, especially French poets. He, he just had a wide range. Um, I will say he published Allen Ginsberg's Howl and was taken to court for publishing such a thing, eventually won in court. Uh, one thing Kathleen didn't mention that's close to my heart is that Lawrence opened the first paperback bookstore in the United States, the first solely paperback bookstore. And Andy had a publishing company, Andy was a poet. Hey, I've got a bookstore, I've got a publishing poet, a poet I'm a poet, look what he did to me. You know, this is, <laughs> thank you, Lawrence. He actually came to Brunswick and gave a, a, he did a book signing at our store and then he gave a reading at Bowdoin College, but, the students wanted him to come, but Bowdoin, the English department said, oh, he's not a poet. We, we wouldn't pay to have him come read here. So a fraternity used their speaker's fee to bring Lawrence to Bowdoin College and he packed the place and gave a great reading, but he wasn't in the Norton Anthology back then. Uh, so, so uh, you know, he was, he was working outside of the norms and he always did. And, and uh, I love him and I'm just, he did so much for, for poetry. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. Uh, I seem to have lost the link. Can you see me and hear me? I can. Yeah, it says yeah. launch meeting. I don't know. Okay, we'll go on. <laughs> and uh, so I said before that we have some students here from the University of Maine Honors College, and we have been studying various things this semester, including um, the souls of Black folk and and also um, James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. And uh, as part of all that, we listened to uh, Strange Fruit, the wonderful uh, song that was written by Abel Mirapol in 1937 as a poem, Strange Fruit, and then Billie Holiday made it famous. In fact, some people think and want to call it the most important poem of the 20th century. So Kiki Andriosi, if you're here, she's going to be reading the Abel Maripol poem. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yes. <laughs> Thanks. I'm very soft-spoken, so I apologize. Um, I'm very thankful to be here. Thank you. Um, okay. Strange Fruit by Abel Maripol, 1937. Southern trees bearing a strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the root, black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from popular trees. Pastoral scene of the gallant south, the bulging eyes and the twisted mouth. Scent of Mongolia, sweet and fresh, then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Here is a fruit for the crow to pluck, for the rain to wither, for the wind to suck, for the sun to rot, 
for the trees to drop. Here is a strange and bitter crop. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And now we're gonna actually hear and see Billie Holiday singing. Oh, the trees, they're strange fruit, blood on the leaves, and blood at the root, black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. Strange fruit hanging up up the trees. Pastoral scene of the gallant south. Bulging eyes. And the twisted mouth, scent of magnolia, sweet and fresh. Then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Here is a fruit. For the crows to pluck, for the rain together, for the wind to suck, sun to rock, for the tree to. Here is a strange and bitter Okay. Yeah, it was a little, little woozy there, but, um, but her voice uh, does take your breath away. And I wanted to remind you that the theme for today's Poet Speak is why poetry matters. And so the featured poets a little bit later are going to be reading their poems that matter in a time of pandemic and racial injustice climate change and civil unrest. And here we are in the week of, of uh, George Floyd's hearings and uh, they are as crippling to hear as uh, that song is crippling to hear as well. So right now we're gonna move to uh, a number of, of students from uh, our Honors of Civilization series who are going to uh, read from some of the remarks that they wrote in their papers uh, about that had to do with uh, Billie Holiday and the song. And the first is Ruth Lewandowski. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> All right. So one individual determined to silence Billie Holiday was the Federal Bureau of Narcotics Commissioner Harry in Ainslinger. A known racist, Ainslinger believed drugs caused Black people to overstep their boundaries in American society and that Black jazz singers some who smoke marijuana created the devil's music. Anslinger used drugs as a smoking mirror in order to destroy Billie Holiday. He even set up a fake drug scandal, causing her to be imprisoned for a year and a half. The first time I heard Strange Fruit, I was attending a lecture about African-American history. The hall became eerily quiet as we listened to Billie's sorrowful performance. The victims whose photo inspired the song were Thomas Shipp and Abram Smith, and they were hung by a mob of thousands. 
no one was held responsible for their deaths, a sadly familiar ending. Thank you, Ruth. There is no denying the significance and effect of the body language and facial expressions Billie Holiday assumes when performing Strange Fruit. It is absolutely chilling. In the final stanza, she sings, here is the fruit for the crows to pluck, for the rain to gather, for the wind to suck, for the sun to rot, for the tree to drop, here is a strange and bitter crop. Beyond the metaf metaphorical meaning of fruit representing the lynched body of an African-American, there is more to this verse that affected me. The use of assonance within the rhyming words like pluck, suck, rot, drop, and crop all serve to darken the tone of the song and in doing so horrified me even further. The crows and the elements she lists are all representative of those who aided in the abuse, murder, and capitalization of slavery. And frankly, it's a very anger inducing verse of the song. Also, the way Billie Holiday sings the song, the almost monotonous look in her eyes is revelatory of not only anger, but of grief and sadness, all of which I felt myself while watching the performance. And that was uh, Gabby Peluso. We didn't have a chance to introduce you. Next is uh, Allison Ogle. In 1999, Time Magazine designated Strange Fruit the song of the century. For me, the heart-wrenching dichotomy of the second verse is the most poignant, demonstrating the cruel separation of the beauty of the South and its twisted sense of irony in its malicious acts of unjust execution. The lyrics paint a pastoral scene, and sweet smelling magnolia trees, but no one can escape the vivid imagery of dead bodies and their bulging eyes, a common postmortem symptom of death by hanging. Never have I been so moved by such profoundly disturbing lyrics such as these. As a songwriter, I have written many songs with lyrics that are designed to paint a story, but I have never imagined a piece so hauntingly raw. Many have disparaged Billie Holiday for performing this song, and her life comes to a bitter end in part due to retaliation from the racist people who despise Strange Fruit and the story it told. I've always viewed music as a powerful art that can unite millions of people worldwide. And Billie Holiday's rendition of Strange Fruit is an example everyone should draw from when searching for a song that has true power. Thank you, Allie. Next up is Vicki Williams. Hi, guys. Um... So as a musician myself, uh, Billie Holiday is one of my all-time favorite musicians. And Strange Fruit is, without a doubt, one of the most shocking songs to come out in the 1930s. It is vastly different from songs that Holiday had previously released. And it is infamous for its artful bluntness, and Holiday's performance of it gives it even more life. As a singer myself, I cannot help but admire her diction and its connection to the text. For example, the way she sings the word bulging is basically a representation of what the word means. She leans into it, both enunciating it clearly and getting louder to emphasize it. She makes multiple artistic choices like this, which all serve to tell the story. It's possible to almost forget that she's singing because one is so lost in the story that she's so artfully telling. Um, the piano part is just there to support with basic chords under her singing, and that allows the story to come to the forefront. This song is about a shameful, horrible part of our society, and that's meant to be at the forefront, not Holiday's voice and not the piano. This entire song feels like it's showing us something bigger than just some words and some notes. Thank you. Um, next is Emily Potoshnik. Between 1882 and 1968, 4,743 known lynchings occurred in the United States, with 72.7 .7 of them being Black people. Billie Holiday wanted to bring attention to this and encourage others to fight against racism. She sings, Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, which truly stresses the horrors of lynching and how it may have looked to bystanders watching. We also heard earlier how Holiday wanted to incite change with this song and she would only sing it at the end of her performances with no interruptions and in complete darkness other than a light shown on her face. This was important due to the weight this song carried and how powerful it was at the time. Racism still impacts millions of Americans today. Strange Fruit is an extremely powerful song that should be remembered as one 
that helped start the civil rights movement and helped people around the world realize the horrors of lynching. Thank you, Emily. Next is me. <laughs> okay. Okay, in one of his infamous lunch poems, New York poet Frank O'Hara wrote an elegy to Billie Holiday in which he never says her name. Like many of his other lunch poems, O'Hara describes what he sees and does on his noontime walk in downtown Manhattan near his office at the Museum of Modern Art where he was a curator of art and culture. At the end of the poem, he's caught up short by the headline of a newspaper in a kiosk announcing the death of Billie Holiday. And he is so moved by her death that, quote, everyone and I stopped breathing. And we're gonna hear from Abigail Roberts. She's gonna read Frank O'Hara's The Day Lady Died. I'm sure you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? First, we need to see you. There you are. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, sorry, I've been having a lot of mic issues. The Day Lady Died by Frank O'Hara. It is 1220 in New York, a Friday, three days after Bastille Day. Yes, it is 1959 and I go get a shoe shine because I will get off the 419 in East Hampton at 715 and then go straight to dinner, and I don't know the people who will feed me. I walk up the muggy street, beginning to sun, and have a hamburger and a malted, and buy an ugly New World writing to see what the poets in Ghana are doing these days. I go on to the bank, and Miss Stillwagon, first name Linda I once heard, doesn't even look up my balance for once in her life. And in the Golden Griffin, I get a little Verlaine for Patsy, with drawings by Bonnard, although I do think of Heshed, translator Richmond Lattimore, or Brendan Behan's new, new play, or Le Balcon, or Les Negres of Genet. But I don't. I stick with Verlaine after practically going to sleep with quandariness. And for Mike, I just stroll into the Park Lane liquor store and ask for a bottle of Strega. And then I go back where I came from, to Sixth Avenue, and to the tobacconist of the Ziegfeld Theater, and casually ask for a carton of Galoises and a carton of Piquayans, and a New York Post with her face on it. And I'm sweating a lot by now and thinking of leaning on the John door in the five spot while she whispered a song along the keyboard to Mal Waldron and everyone and I stopped breathing. Thank you. We're gonna switch from that now and hear from our featured poets. And uh, I'm gonna start by, by reading a poem that Walt Whitman wrote in, and it appears in his 1860 Leaves of Grass edition, and it's called Astropha, excuse me, apostrophe, <laughs> apostrophe, like apostrophe. And that's what happens in this poem. Every single almost line, there's a couple that don't, starts with O. Oh. <laughs> he, was, he was good at the, at the O, oh, admiring everything about the world. Oh, oh, mater, oh, fields, oh, brood continental, oh, flowers of the prairies, oh, space boundless, oh, hum of mighty products, oh, you teeming cities, oh, so invincible, turbulent, proud, oh, race of the future, oh, women, oh, fathers, oh, you men of passion and the storm, Oh, native power only, oh, beauty, oh, yourself, oh, God, oh, divine average, oh, you bearded roughs, oh, bards, oh, all those slumberers, oh, arouse, the dawn bird's throat sounds shrill, do you not hear the cock crowing? Oh, as I walked the beach, I heard the mournful notes foreboding a tempest, the low, oft-repeated shriek of the diver, the long, <clears throat> excuse me, the long-lived loon. Oh, I heard, and yet hear, angry thunder. Oh, you sailors, oh, ships, I make quick preparation. Oh, from his masterful sweep, the warning cry of the eagle. Give way there. Oh, it is useless. Give up your spoils. 
Oh, sarcasms, propositions. Oh, if the whole world should prove indeed a sham, a sell. Oh, I believe there is nothing real but America and freedom. Oh, to sternly reject all except democracy. Oh, imperator, oh, who dare confront you and me. Oh, to promulgate our own. <clears throat> oh, to build for that which builds for mankind. Oh, fuelage, oh, north. Oh, the slope drained by the Mississippi. Oh, the slope drained by the Mexican Sea. Oh, all, all inseparable, ages, ages, ages. Oh, a curse on him that would dissever dis this union for any reason whatsoever. Oh, climates, labors, oh, good and evil, oh, death. Oh, you strong with iron and wood, oh, personality. Oh, the village or place which has the greatest man or woman, even if it be only a few ragged huts. Oh, the city where women walk in public processions in the streets, the same as the men. Oh, a wan and terrible emblem by, by me adopted. Oh, shapes arising, shapes of the future centuries. Oh, muscle and pluck forever for me. Oh, workmen and work women forever for me. Oh, farmers and sailors. Oh, drivers of horses forever for me. Oh, I will make the new bardic list of trades and tools. Oh, you coarse and willful, I love you. Oh, South, oh, longings for my dear home. Oh, soft and sunny airs. Oh, pensive. Oh, I must return where the palm grows and the mockingbird sings or else I die. Oh, equality. Oh, organic compacts. I am come to be your born poet. Oh, whirl, contest, sounding and resounding. I am your poet because I am part of you. Oh, days bygone, enthusiasts, antecedents. Oh, vast preparations for these states. Oh, years. Oh, what is now being sent toward forward thousands of years to come. Oh, mediums. Oh, to teach to convey the invisible faith, to promulge real things, to journey through all the states. Oh, creation, oh, today, oh, laws, oh, unmitigated adoration. Oh, for mightier broods of orators, artists, and singers. Oh, for native songs, carpenters, boatmen, plowmen songs, shoemakers songs. Oh, haughtiest growth of time. Oh, free and ecstatic. Oh, what I hear preparing warble for. Oh, you hastening light. Oh, the son of the world will ascend, dazzling and take his height, and you too will ascend. Oh, so amazing and so broad. Up there, resplendent, darting and burning. Oh, prophetic. Oh, vision staggered with weight of light, with pouring glories. Oh, copious. Oh, hitherto unequal. Oh, libertad. Oh, compact. Oh, union impossible to dissever. Oh, my soul. Oh, lips becoming tremulous, powerless. Oh, centuries, centuries yet ahead. Oh, voices of greatest orators. I pause, I listen for you. Oh, you states, cities, defiant of all outside authority. I spring at once into your arms. You, I most love. Oh, you grand presidentiads, I wait for you. New history, new heroes, I project you. Visions of poets, only you really last. Oh, sweep on, sweep on. Oh, death, oh, you striding there. Oh, I cannot yet. Oh, heights, oh, infinitely too swift and dizzy yet. Oh, purged, looming, you threaten me more than I can stand. Oh, present, I return while yet I may to you. Oh, poets to come. I depend upon you. After that, <laughs> I don't think I can read another poem. It took a lot of breath and, and energy. And so even though we're going to be writing about poems that matter under our, the circumstances of uh, the past year and a half with the, with the pandemic, but also thinking of everything else that uh, has been going on for maybe the last four or five years, um, I wanted to start with, with our good American bard who, even in the, the worst times during the Civil War, still had hope. 
And so we're gonna start with um, Leonore Hildebrand, who's the author of the poetry collections, The Work at Hand and The Next Unknown and Where You Happen to Be. Her poems and translations have appeared in the Cafe Review, the Cerise Press, the Cimarron Review, Denver Quarterly, Harbor Palette, Poetry Daily, Reno, and Reno, Rhino, Salzburg Poetry Review, and the Sugar House Review, among other journals. She was nominated several times for a Pushcart Prize. She's a native of Germany, but now lives off the grid in Harrington, Maine, and spends the winters in Silver City, New Mexico. Welcome, Leonore. Thank you, Kathleen, and thank all of you for coming to the Poets Speak. And I want to especially thank the students who, who spoke so with such wisdom and, and knowledge and feeling that that gives me hope. Um, and I think poetry matters when it brings us closer to experience, our experience and historical experience. And you all did that. I, I feel so honored to be here. So I have four short poems, and um, so let's just go. The first one is called, This Baby. My baby's name is precious. My baby's name is gone. My baby prince, my baby king, my baby porcelain. My baby shoestring, baby apron. My baby tumble, my baby acrobat, my baby limitless, my baby bandit, baby polka dot, my baby ally, baby round the clock, my baby up the ante, my baby leave no mark, vigilante, my baby at the door, my baby never more, my baby cradled. My baby clingy, the men they come, the baby too, the grave ravine of falling in, my baby still alive. This long ago, this no more so, this baby I let go, this baby blue, this baby you, this baby mine, this baby. Mm for the Jewish woman who shot, for the Jewish woman shot dead by three Ukrainian militias as a German soldier stood by. Mm. Now to our time, the pandemic has shown us how connected we are on a global scale. So here is a poem also inspired by a, a photo I saw in the news. Safe. Have you seen the man with the black woolen hat? He might be at the courthouse, the police, the hospital. He was on the ground while several men beat and kicked him as he tried to creep away. They blame him for spreading the virus. I yelled, but the sound went nowhere. His mother lives in a house of tin. People are these, she says. Bring him home to me. The man with the wool and hat needs to heal. Tell him that help is on the way. He might be hiding in the migrant camp. He might be standing in line for food. Here's the pandemic poem about a road trip through the U.S. of Maine. Geographies. The body is an interplay of forces. As some cells die off, others grow. I am fine with porous borders, with borrowing, a language, a culture, a system of exchange. We are driving through a continent sectioned by formidable highways. There's the thunder of engines, 
the repeating clusters of signage, the impenetrable barriers of asphalt and concrete. This used to be hardwood forest. This used to be prairie. It is humbling to live unharmed in a time of upheaval when so many are hurt. My mother hasn't been taken from her home by masked people and protective gear. My children have not grown up in fear. The demagogue who invaded my thoughts does not force my words, my deeds. And still there is grief. I doze off and dream of a dead dog slumped over me, its coat of fur draped also around the drum between my knees. In the dream, I do not mind the dead dog. I am drumming a litany of goodbyes. In this country, we could not stop for death but how eagerly death stopped for us. Our hands are meant to give and to receive. I want another chance with my daughter, even as we hold our breaths. The sun hovers red over the horizon and I long for its grand affection. Blue is for departure for crossing a divide. My loves, we remain apart, at odds with the mammal's need for touch and skin. See the sky over those hills? As spaces are left behind, new ones open. Let me borrow kinship then, the blue distance and the setting sun even as it blinds my eyes. And I'd like to close with a poem written around the time of the election. It's called Happy After All. Some people like it giddy and sweet. Some people can't help probe the knife's sharp edge. There was the time we wondered, is this a coup? Then we remembered the basics. You need a plan for that. You need the military. Happy after all, we danced in the street. Granted, the world has become harsher. Are my eyes more attuned? I saw a daughter's trepidation in France a young Muslim girl whom the police questioned after her teacher was beheaded. After all, this was reported and we saw the picture, the girl seated on a couch and next to her, a gray cloaked woman whom I mistook for her grandmother. I have much to learn about the ways of others. Still, we want another chapter in our romance with death. The marvelous trees are catching the sun, after all. Someday, that girl may be the leader we need. Is that it? That is it. That's it. And thank you. Those are wonderful. Our next uh, poet is Rich Hawk, and he's been reading his poetry in Central and Mid Coast Maine, including at Poets Speak, <clears throat> since 2013. Uh, this is this is actually the 19th annual Poets Speak, so we've been around for a while. Uh, Rich currently lives in Western Maine, where he works as a chemical engineering engineer, developing industrial wastewater treatment technology for the military and the private sector. Before he graduated from the University of Maine in chemical engineering, he was my student in honors, creative writing, and advanced poetry writing. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm, there you are. I'm glad to be here, for everybody. Um, I just have a, 
uh, two poems today. They're a little bit longer. I find that um, I usually write longer lyrical poems, but I find that in quarantine, I, I, I keep writing the same poem. <laughs> so I, I, I've started writing a couple more narrative poems. So I just have two. They're a little bit longer. Um, the first one is uh, called Transient. Outside is usually at its most earthly when you're leaving a hospital and nothing is clean. But clean doesn't smell like nothing. It smells like cleaning, an oxidant, probably bleach, replacing complication with chlorine. It should at least smell like exhaust, cigarettes, or soggy exhalation from a cafeteria vent. People leaving. If I were going, it would at least name it. In an evening like another accident, when a plan doesn't realize itself, and a saw stays a saw, splitting open into the aftermath. I'm emitting everything I can with yet another handful of people trying to admit it. But the night is a sink because I never seem to get around to putting anything in it that would stall our letting happen. Maybe someone else who could run their fingers along the rings under its eyes would name 5 p.m. gunmetal black, the dark that starts the night. Or someone else who could lapse into this as the silence after conversation, realizing the world has turned beneath us, us talking, working on an afterward in the terminal before the cars seal us away, because I wish we were. Walking through the automatic doors, we redefined. Every time I'm in the hospital, I'm lost in plain clothes. Maybe I care, maybe I'm considered. In the gift shop, kept warm enough to accept my jacket, I considered that it's the little red bow on the bear that makes it a present. And that I would only buy a present for someone younger or older than me, or for anyone I could, couldn't share with. A present would make me considered a caring visitor. All the ribbons, tags, cards, pedals, ID badges are provided to caretakers for access. Mm. Where did you leave your dog tag? Yes, it does seem cruel, otherwise utterly unremarkable. But if this would be your present, I'll ask T for some of the decorations that you left us in the garage. Mm. I'll peel the reams of dried blood running down the walls, pull apart the ribbon from the bow you turned your head into, and string them up along the street lights. I'll finish grinding the bones into confetti, pick up all your noisemakers, and fill the throughway with the ringing in. You put on everyone's face the look of being afterwards. So, <laughs> a little heavy in in times of quarantine, but um, the, the second poem is, is also pretty heavy. Unfortunately, um, uh, a couple of months ago, I lost my grandpa and my uncle to the coronavirus. And um, it, it was odd because during that two weeks, I just could call them. Um, and they weren't symptomatic for the longest time. And then all of a sudden they took a turn and they didn't end up recovering. Um, and I was left odd because you could just call and it didn't seem like anything was wrong. Mm -hmm. And so at, when they let me know, I figured that they weren't going to make it through quite a bit older. But it, even after the fact, there was this time where I just couldn't find grief. And this poem, I guess, is that is that odd feeling of, of you know, most people just kind of run away from grief or just it kind of washes over them inescapably, but I was in this odd situation of trying to find it and trying to talk to my grandpa, my grandma who survived afterward. And th this poem is essentially me kind of wrapping up the experience of, of seeking out grief and trying to, trying to handle this situation. Um, so, yeah, so this is the last one. It's titled Seriality. Sure. When a message from grandpa is us sitting on the porch in a closure, and the past will become permanent. I'm just staring out across the field. There's not enough time. Maybe not. 
I've been video calling grandma since. She's frustrated, sweaty, apparently being left with some mess behind her phone that the Mexican nurse is leaving. She wants the poet to collect some loved ones and we'll take her home, telling me she's somewhere in town. I try to remind her that she's down in San Miguel. Will any more truth to deepen the dream's premise or worse? With breaking sarcasm, she says, well, thanks for telling me that. Grandpa isn't in the list of people I'm supposed to lead, so at least she knows what day it is. Maybe she's starting the day by writing it into a piece of paper. Maybe the news keeps reminding her how close they were, like some small drop of synthetic oil from the machine of society or connected in convention. At my desk, columns on spreadsheets, pages of granular data, dots and digits, the particle that delights and obscures the fabric of the universe along some fundamental oscillation that is resonating. As if a magnet were lowering in the thin glittering layer of filings, stacks of paper, heartbeats, lap tracks were scattered into some radial order of mostly openness. Is it at the poles? Most will never know, certainly not me, but a day and another and a trailer, and it is my body. I set out with the mountains of light snow winding on top of the ground snow, pulling a sled of humanity tied to my waist through the cold. Am I walking between? Every thought feels like walking, but to the next, to conclude that being lost is a million crystalline moments of choice and purpose. But here at the frigid cut that does not bleed, it does not heal, the context is faltering. There is a convulsion in my teeth. My spit is fever bred, vile, the poisonous taste of something wrong. Too much vitamin A in my food, too little food, the same clothes for a life worn raw, the blending of sores into soiled cloth, the dissolution of tissue with the splaying of fundamental order, a sample pressed between glass plates. I'm on the ground only alive. A flare of orange and red, blinking cold LED, the buffeting of a helicopter, a thick carabiner, canvas straps, and fluid practiced motions. I guess the psychopomp pilots a rescue helicopter and the Greeks never told us that the end brings an escort of loved ones, all highly trained EMTs. Aboard, I see grandpa looking at me disturbed, disappointed that the solid state fuel that was supposed to save the world smolders with fragrant embarrassment. They remove my clothes to some withered framework, lacquered with plasma the honest effort of a body trying to heal. But from my darkened hands, an abyss of my blood, my empty torso, and what I have been eating, surviving on to the end, were handfuls of my own organs. Safe, warm, wrapped in a silver mylar sheet, I wonder, what, I, what is it I set out here for? We won't tell grandma about this. She keeps asking because she loves, but I can't send her any of my poems. Beautiful. Um, we're sorry for your loss. Um, Rolf lost his mother to COVID about a month ago too. So I can really feel for you. Beautiful poem. Thank you. Um, next. Next is Annalise Giacomides, whose poetry and po prose have been broadcast on local and national public radio, published in many journals, magazines, and anthologies. Nominated for the Pushcart Prize, she's been the recipient of the Acadia Prize for Poetry and a finalist for the Stephen Dunn Poetry Prize and the Maine Literary Awards in both poetry and nonfiction, among others. She lives in Bangor, but you're still there. You don't look like her. 
Annalise. Remembering to unmute. <laughs> First of all, I, thank you very much, Kathleen. I'd like to say how honored I am to be at the 19th um, uh, Poet Speak with particularly all of these voices um, who will come after and all of the featured poets and all of the students. Um, it's just testament to how words support us, how they help us get through enormous things. I'm gonna read four poems and the opening and closing ones, um, just to set it up a little bit for you, um, are written to in response to artwork. And it just seems that in these times, there's this need for me to be, to see the connections between things, to see the connections between places or people or events or, or, or moves or movements and um, genres and all of that. So there's something about that that I can't quite define, but that's part of it. Uh, the first um, poem I'm reading is written to Bill Irvin's painting. And also all of these poems have been written in this last year in the time of our isolation. Uh, it's a, a, a painting by Bill Irvin that just so you can see it, it's um, a little white cabin. It's very simple. There are two figures up in the upstairs window and there's a very simple, austere, large moon outside. It's called My Brother Arrives. Before you look, imagine you are the painter at the beginning, blocking out everything you don't want to see, blindfold on. Beyond water gleams, bubble of broken moonlight, such comfort, head on shoulder, Maybe soon, choke cherry jelly a glitter on a breakfast blade, its ivory handle balanced on the old china plate. But here is where my brother, you may have another, maybe a mother secret lover, under the crucible of such tenderness, would stumble out onto the porch, into the yard, slip over tarmac, littered with his unbearable otherness. Uncertain he knows anything about anyone, except the guy who lives across the hall, a room renter too, getting his monthly check. My brother has never fished or traveled, no cabin under moon heavens. Although he used to dream of villas and a life of possibility, he limits his dreams to what he already knows, needles and white powder, starved shade, bursting storms. Let your eyes wander back to the girl in the window, the moon now bloomed full, just to bring things into focus in the bleached dark of pre-morning. Dust floats, swirls, snapshots hang in my head. Black light flashes, lines sh shiver. You know we have seen something to love here, heavy in the geography of souls. Toddler boy with your new false teeth, will I recognize you? The next poem, um, just a little bit of a setup here. Um, about a year and a half before uh, the pandemic and the shutdown, my, my love died. And then less than a, a, a year later, um, an extraordinary friend much younger than I am in Bangor passed also. And then all of a sudden we shut down. So when we talk about isolation, I live alone and it's a very isolated life. It has been a very, very isolated life. And morning, any day, any time of day drives have saved my life. So this is called Morning Drive. Call to the sky, she wakes with sorrow and the opportunity to write the questions. Or so she was told the morning she learned how to whistle in open air. Toggling now between safety and salvation, she drives into the yoke of morning sun leaking along the ridge of restless spring limbs. In that moment, it's a beautiful thing. The fantasy of time cannot take away love, a shadow of shed skin in full color, raining down over a fallow field and its solitary barn. She leans out the window, drawing great lines of energy through space and watches all the bodies floating home. 
when I read this next one and I mention some colors, they actually refer to cosmological terms. Naming begun for Elijah McLean, February 25th, 1996 to August 27th, 2019. Driving around the stars, slipping in and out of a box of darkness, black holes, red giants, white dwarfs are banging and twanging on space. While Elijah McLean puts down his violin and iced tea on his last walk home. Police, again, black man, again, no noticing, again, until one violinist, two violinists, many violinists note what you see, keep showing up, lifting him up out of silence, a garrison of stars acknowledged. And the last poem, um, once again, written to a piece of artwork started associated with a different piece of artwork. And it has morphed over time. So it, it's, it, and that morphing is important, much like we're talking about the, I was talking about the connections. You know, we're increasingly on the cusp of opening up our boxes, and yet we're also on the cusp of closing ourselves off into more boxes. And so it's very important that various things can talk to each other and make change. This is written to David Driscoll's Ghetto Wall, which was um, painted in, the, in 1970, the year of the centennial of the 15th Amendment. And the 15th Amendment is the one in which we're saying nobody can be, de be denied the right to vote regardless of race, you know, country of origin, um, servitude, any of those kinds of things. And this poem started out attached to the women's right to vote. And it has, it, as I said, it has morphed over time. So, and this poem then was written in the year of the sesquicentennial of the 15th amendment. It's called Throughput. Insist on ferocious inarticulate joy. You must, dark could come again, early, still, even, if not vigilant, aware of the flashing lights and those sitting on the curb. All these years out and yet not just. Much to do, things can be broken or slashed, zippered in beautiful flying tents. So many messages threatening to keep us small. Don't be fooled or lulled. The long quiet of sleep may be rest climbing on your tongue. Tennessee didn't ratify 15 till 97, 1997. And who else? And where, we all know why, still at it, other ways. Remember vigilance? Days and weeks and months, years, decades, centuries. Bird unnoticed stands in the middle of the road, wings down, beating against brick and stone, ricocheting complacency. Now is the time to take up the needle, thread the reds and yellows, gold, black, brilliant okras, and stitch together our ragged laughter, anxious bellies, the scars. No need to wield preopic clubs. Be fearlessly iridescent. Thank you. Love that last poem, it's beautiful. Um, Okay, Gary Lawless is going to replace you. Do you have, I don't know what you have to do. <laughs> Gary Lawless is uh, probably everybody here knows is the co-owner of the Gulf of Maine Books in Brunswick, Maine and publisher of Blackberry Books. And, and everyone should go to his bookstore. It is the best one uh, in all the East Coast. I have to save out the, the West Coast for uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, at least for today. And <clears throat> Gary's published 19 collections of poems in the US and five in Italy. He grew up in Belfast, uh, close to the heart of Edna St. Vincent Millay Company and a country, and he has been very active in, in various Malay activities over the years as well. Gary. I'm unmuting, I'm unmuting. Um, first, I wanna say listening to the strange fruit to the presentations 
makes me think how in the last four years we've been ruled by men without empathy. The, and, and Strange Fruit was, was written by a white Jewish man who has incredible empathy and, and for Billie Holiday to, to take his poem and sing it. I mean, just, he gave her those words. It's, it's a pretty remarkable yeah. move by a poet to change the world. So I, I just want to, empathy may come back. <laughs> uh, wow. So this, this is a poem by uh, Lawrence Frilinghetti. Oh, great. Pity the nation whose people are sheep and whose shepherds mislead them. Pity the nation whose leaders are liars, whose sages are silent, and whose bigots haunt the airwaves. Pity the nation that raises not its voice except to praise conquerors and acclaim the bully as hero and aims to rule the world with force and by torture. Pity the nation that knows no other language but its own no other culture but its own. Pity the nation whose breath is money and sleeps the sleep of the too well fed. Pity the nation, oh, pity the people who allow their rights to erode and their freedoms to be washed away. My country, tears of thee, sweet land of liberty. A poem by the wonderful Lawrence Frilinghetti. May we all remember Lawrence and celebrate him. My grandparents, my mother's parents lived in Prospect, just down the river from Bangor, a little ways down the Penobscot. And Prospect was especially uh, busy in, that in their time hauling granite out of the ground. Uh, and this is a poem for that granite and for my grandfather. My grandfather, Lester Dow, came from Prospect, Maine. Prospect and its neighboring town, Frankfurt, were granite towns with the quarries on Mount Waldo, Mosquito Mountain. Lester had a store in Prospect serving the local farmers and quarrymen. My grandfather, Lester, walked down, down to his store and the crossroads at the center of town now buried with his wife, Hannah, across the road, low on the hillside, there also my mother's first school. My uncle, Earl, walked down, down to the marsh and to Bucksport, beyond to the mill, making paper. The mill now closed down, soon to be gone. From Prospect, the land itself falls down to the river Penobscot, to Bucksport, beyond, and the whole world somewhere below us now. We have been to those quarries, touched the stone. In granite time, in stone time, things move slowly. In granite time, my grandfather has just left. I can almost hear his voice. Mm. I hear the granite singing and it is alive. I want to tell you that granite is a migratory species. Think plate tectonics, continental drift, glacial erratics, the goddamn Washington Monument. You can read the flow lines from when the granite was liquid and moving quickly. I want to tell you that lichen is a language of granite, that granite speaks with air and water and light, we might never know what stories it holds deep within the rock. Deep within the rock, I can almost hear his voice. Mm. Nice. Uh, this is a little poem. My, I have 11 acres of pasture now and it has a conservation easement for birds, bees, and butterflies. So this is a poem called Planting for Bees and Butterflies. The air, the air was here before us, the water, the rock, all here before us, the unnamed insects, the wandering tribes of earth and sky. Every day I bless the aster, bless the milkweed, bless the goldenrod, sing to the bees, the monarchs, the rising songs of the birds, yet every day an elegy 
a death song. The heart cries out for love and loss, grief and joy, the birds flying through, the heart rising. And the wonderful Lisa Panapinto, who's coming up soon. Uh, Lisa and I were part of a, a, a sort of not so good oppor uh, opportunity for with an art gallery in Portland. And we were supposed to write on the theme of I am an American, which to me is bogus right away because that's sort of a colonialist, I, you know, the rocks were here before us. Everything was here before us. We're, we're really late. In the, so anyway, I wrote this poem about, for that show. What is the face of America? Granite, limestone, rock face, upthrust, delta, rich soil and deep forest, swift rivers flowing, deep ice and first peoples. Where are the borders, mountains, rivers, glaciers, edge, everything moving, everything moving, wind, water, night, sky, stars, great flocks flying. Great schools swimming, great herds moving, crossing, 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 touching the edge of ice, seeds on the breeze and sunlight. Put your roots down and you are welcome here. Welcome home. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, Lisa Panapinto is going to take your place. Good. <laughs> <laughs> She's been her writing has appeared in the Glass Block, Hyart, Pittsburgh City Paper, Red Flag Poetry, Yes Poetry, and more. She's been a mentor and senior companion with the United Way as an AmeriCorps Vista, as and as an American Corps Vista volunteer, and received the President's Volunteer Service Award. She is poetry editor for Cabildo Quarterly and author of Where I Come From, The Fish Have Souls, On This Borrowed Bike, and the chapbook, Island Dreams. Thank you, Kathleen. Yeah, sorry, I messed that up. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Yeah. OK. Good, I can't see myself for some reason, it's, but I'll start. Good evening, it's wonderful to be with you all on the theme of why poetry matters. I've been lucky enough to hear poet Martina Spada read twice the first time I was a student at Stone Coast. And he said to a group of us, of course this stuff matters. The fascists who imprison and kill poets for protesting oppression realize the power of poetry. And indeed, just recently, several Burmese poets were jailed and killed for opposing a military coup in Burma. So I dedicate this reading to all who have been persecuted for using creativity to fight for liberation, including Billie Holiday. I'll start with some new poems I've been working on. This first is called, I Keep Drumming to Aretha Slow. I keep drumming to Aretha Slow in mourning for the black worshipers murdered in a South Carolina church during Bible study by a young white supremacist trained to kill himself in Christ. The city shoots down poor people of color daily by housing them next to oil refineries, erupting poison gas, burning residents' lungs each night. Rabbits and starlings along the river, please wash away coal plants exploding that pollute sweet water Please mend the hearts of traitors who kill their own savior. I keep drumming to Aretha slow. And this next poem's titled, No More Ocean Drilling Pandemic. A pod of orcas breached the turquoise water. I heard them say, the boats are too loud. We're sick of screaming. The whole world's hospitalized. News reports said factory farms slaughter and dump milk and meat in fields now, rather than give excess to the poor or care for animals. Hundreds of meat packers got sick with the virus. The CDC said, meat is safe, essential, go to work, even if sick. Billionaires said the meat packing plant is a hospital where the dead are safe at work. People of color are more likely to be hospitalized from the virus. If the ocean has no oxygen, the whole world's dying. 
Let me wash away the cruelty towards people and animals through being horrified by those deeds. Let masks, food, medicine, water, homes, and money be given to everyone for free. Rest for all. No more ocean drilling pandemic. No enslaved, mistreated mothers on produce farms and factories. Let the strength of my love make cages extinct. Let flowers and berries be planted by wild birds again, trees pruned by deer, transporting and buying less, foraging, growing foods, and reusing more. Mountains left as they are. No new towers on holy hill. Dogs running free, needing the sea to breathe. And I recently watched an Alice Walker talk on YouTube and she noted how our minds are constantly under attack by the colonizer. So we must actively protect our minds. And I wrote this last poem I'll read. It's a new one too, to try and protect my mind. Salutations to you, sun who is the source of all, perfect light inside. I am alive. Your illuminated brilliance gives me all. Cradled in blue ridges, streams leading to shining peaks overlooking jeweled island, neon green mosses, hemlock grandmothers waiting to be heard, all sky, all self, supreme friend, you must be honored and protected. Look at your veins pulsing, the unbelievable miracle of your skin, your perfect lips bringing me only the most needed words of assurance, good air, good light, good water, good lightning, good pollen, good rain, the soothing words, I forgive you, healing instantly, whispering kindness to each cell of my body, to each cell of universe. You are powerful, you are whole, you know everything. The sight of kindness heals me, my right hand massaging my left hand, Robin's laughing. Oh, perfect light inside, I believe in you pulsing star who gives to all. Let me be a nurturing grandmother like you. Let me not forget you. That's it. That's Thank you it. so much. Very nice. That, that puts a, a really beautiful sheen on the whole afternoon. Um, thank you so much, everybody. And to the students, if you're still around, thank you so much for participating and, and um, moving all of us <laughs> to an extreme uh, with, the, with the personal statements, especially that you made about Billie Holiday. Thank you all for coming, all the people I can't see, thank you for coming. And um, next year will be the 20th. And uh, hopefully it won't be a mini, maybe it'll be a, a maxi poet speak. We all hope for that. And it's so good to see dear friends who are all lined up here on, on the side of the screen and, and also Lisa. And um, so, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yep. Thank you, Kathleen, for organizing this. And uh, we'll be in touch about next year soon, I'm sure. Thank you, everybody. Great. Uh, can I say one thing? Yes. Can I say one thing? Rich, get in touch with me. OK. Did, do you have any good news? Not yet. OK, OK. But still, let me know. OK. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. <laughs>